Chapter 34 With a start, Luke woke up. For a moment he stayed where he was, fighting against the usual floundering of trance-induced disorientation as he made a quick assessment of the situation. He was seated in a slightly uncomfortable seat, he recognized, with an unfamiliar control board in front of him and a curved canopy in front of that. From somewhere behind him, a handful of soft nightlights glowed. In front of him, outside the canopy, it was completely dark outside. He blinked, coming suddenly fully awake. Completely dark outside. He fumbled with his restraints, throwing a glance at his chrono as he did so, and paused, giving the chrono a second look. He'd been in the healing trance for nearly five hours. Five hours? Mara, I said to wake me in two hours, he called back towards the rear of the ship, getting free of the restraints and stumbling to his feet. What happened? You fall asleep back there yourself? But there was no answer, only the sudden frantic twittering from R2. And there was also no Mara. Oh no, Luke breathed, stretching his mind out to flick through every corner of the ship. Mara was nowhere to be found. R2? Where is she? he snapped, dropping to one knee and lifting up the datapad translator still hooked up to the droid. The words scrolled across it. What do you mean she left? he demanded. When? Why? R2 moaned mournfully. Luke gazed at the words flowing across the datapad, his heart sinking inside him. Mara had left five hours ago, right after he'd settled into his trance. R2 didn't know where she'd gone, or why, but both of those, Luke could already guess. It's all right, he sighed, patting the droid reassuringly as he got back to his feet. I know there was no way you could have stopped her. He crossed to the hatch, the taste of terrible fear mixing with the bitter knowledge that whatever she had gone off to do, it was far too late now for him to stop her either. Keep an eye on the ship, he told the little droid, popping open the hatch. I'll be back as soon as I can. He stepped outside, not bothering with the ladder, but simply dropping to the ground. Directly overhead, between the surrounding cliff peaks, patches of stars shone brightly down through the gaps between drifting clouds. Everywhere else, all was darkness. Mara, he called out, shouting her name hopelessly into the silent night with his mind. It was as if a cloaked and hooded figure had stirred. Somewhere not far away, a dark, hiding presence seemed to shift. A crack opened between cloak and hood. Up here, her thought came back. Luke peered up at the blackness of the cliff directly overhead, caught between the sudden relief that she was still alive and the sobering sense that something terrible was still about to happen. The glimpse faded as Mara seemed to pull her mental cloak back around her. Where are you? Luke sent the thought outward, fighting back the temptation to break through this cocoon she had suddenly and inexplicably retreated into. He sensed her hesitation, and her almost resigned sigh. Then, flashing into his mind like glimpses seen in a flickering light, he caught a series of images of the rock face in front of him, marking the route she'd taken up. Sending an acknowledgement and encouragement back towards her, he crossed to the cliff and started up. The climb wasn't nearly as tricky as he had thought it would be, and with Jedi strength and muscles behind it, the trip took less than ten minutes. He found Mera sitting on a rough ledge near the peak, braced sideways against the partial shelter of a rugged upthrust of rock. Hello, she called quietly as he came up onto the final ridge. How are you feeling? Completely healed, he said, frowning at her as he maneuvered his way along the ridge and sat down beside her. Her voice had been quiet and controlled, but beneath the dark cloak of her mental barrier, he could sense the edge of an incredible sadness. What's going on? In the faint sheen of starlight, he saw her right hand lift and point ahead. The hand of Thrawn's over there, she said. You can see the four back towers against the clouds when the light's right. Luke gazed that direction, running through his sensory enhancement techniques. The towers and back wall of the fortress were indeed visible, 
along with a hint of something between the leftmost towers that was probably the flat roof of the hangar they'd fought their way out of a few hours ago. What have they been doing? he asked. Nothing much, Mara said. That ship that was out. Remember the gap we saw in the parking array? It got in about three hours ago. Luke grimaced. A functional ship, sitting right there in front of the ones he'd sabotaged, ready to head off to Bastion at a moment's notice. It hasn't left again? He sensed the shake of her head. Not that I could tell. Anyway, Park said they'd be debriefing the pilot before he made a final decision. I see, Luke murmured. A debriefing that, under the circumstances, Park and Fell would undoubtedly be hurrying along as quickly as they could. A fast decision, a fast lift back into the sky, and the Empire would have the hand of Thrawn on all its secrets. And yet here he and Mera sat, waiting. But for what? It's funny, you know, Mera murmured from beside him. Ironic, really. Here we are, the woman who spent ten years trying to build a new life for herself, and the man who spent those same ten years rushing madly around trying to save the galaxy from every new threat that reared its ugly face. That's us, all right, Luke said, eyeing her uneasily. The twisting darkness in her was growing stronger. Not sure I see the irony, though. The irony is that with the New Republic ready to tear itself apart, you rushed off to save me, Mara said, ignoring your self-delegated responsibilities in order to save that one woman and her one life. He felt her take a deep breath. And that one woman, she added, almost too quietly to hear, is now the one who has to sacrifice that new life she wanted, to save the new republic. Abruptly, a distant flash of pale green light illuminated her face. A face carved from stone, a face gazing with terrible pain and loneliness into the night. Looks like you got here just in time, she said, as a faint thundercrack echoed in the distance. There was a second green flash. With an effort, Luke tore his eyes from her tortured face and turned to look. The towers were firing. Even as he focused on them, another pair of green turbolaser flashes lanced out from the top of one of them across the sky, followed by a pair from one of the other towers firing across the landscape in the opposite direction from where he and Mara sat. Ranging shots, probably, Mara said, her voice the deceptive calm of an overly taut spring. Trying to gauge the distance. It won't be long now. Luke looked back at her. The pain within her was growing, pressing outward against her mental barrier like floodwaters against a dam. Mara, what's going on? It was all your idea, you know, she continued, as if he hadn't spoken. You're the one who wanted so much for me to become a Jedi. She sniffed loudly, the sound of someone fighting back tears. Remember? And then, from the fortress, a flurry of turbolaser shots abruptly burnt out, the green fire accompanied this time by a counterpart of blue from Chiss-style weaponry. All four towers were firing now firing madly and persistently, all in the same direction. Luke craned his neck, trying to see, wondering what in the worlds they could be shooting at. Had Card sent in a backup force after all? Had the New Republic found them, or the Empire, or one of those hundred terrible dangers Park had talked about? He looked back at Mara, and in that single awful heartbeat, he knew. Mara, he breathed. No. Oh, no. It had to be done, she said, her voice trembling. In the backwash of light from the enemy fire, Luke could see she was no longer even trying to hold back the tears. It was the only way to keep them from talking all, taking all of this and handing it to Bastion. The only way. Luke looked back at the fortress, the knife of Mara's grief digging in beneath his own heart a sudden frenzy of thought and urgency swirling through his mind. If he'd woken up earlier, if he'd forced his way through her mental barriers back in the fortress and learned her private plan, if he even now stretched out with the full power of the Force. Don't, Mara murmured, 
her voice infinitely tired. Please, don't. It's my sacrifice, don't you see? The final sacrifice every Jedi has to go through. Her fumbling hand reached out to touch his. It felt very cold. There's nothing you can do. Nothing at all. Luke inhaled raggedly, the cool night air digging like the ice of Hoth into his lungs, his hands and mind and heart aching with the overwhelming desire to do something. To do anything. But she was right. He could hate it. He could bitterly oppose it. But down deep, he knew she was right. The universe wasn't his responsibility. Decisions made by other people, their actions, their consequences, even their sacrifices, they weren't his responsibility either. Mara had made her choice and had accepted the consequences for it. And he had neither the duty nor the right to try to take it away from her, which left only one thing he could do. Moving closer to her on the ledge, he put his arm around her. For a moment she resisted, old fears and habits and loneliness mixing together with her roiling pain to stiffen her muscles away from him. But only for a moment. Then, as if that part two of her life had now been lost, she melted against his side, her so carefully constructed barriers bursting aside as she finally poured out the grief and loss she had held so deeply and privately inside her. Luke wrapped his arm tighter around her, murmuring meaningless words as he fought with her through the storm of pain and misery, absorbing what he could of it and offering what comfort and warmth he could in return. In the distance, the firing from the towers increased. And then, above the edge of the cliff, he saw it. Cutting low over a distant hill, its hull burnished by the surrealistic effect of full shields operating in atmosphere. It twisted and writhed like a living thing as it evaded their dodge or simply shrugged off the withering firestorm, savaging the air around it, firing back steadily but uselessly in return at the impenetrable black stone rising before it. Drawn like a Minoc to a power cable by the beckon call Mera had spliced into one of the alien ship's comm systems, it was driving its single-minded way towards the open hangar entrance, the one single weak point in the entire fortress. Mera's personal ship, the one thing in the universe she truly owned. The Jade's Fire. The tears had stopped now, Mera's shoulders tensing beneath Luke's arm as she leaned tautly forward to watch. The fire was almost to the hand of Thrawn now, and Luke could see that beneath the burnishing effect the hull had been torn open in a dozen different places, some with the yellow swirling of raging fires blazing behind them. The towers intensified their attack, but it was too late. The fire dipped one final time, vanishing from their view, and with a brilliant yellow-orange fireball that blasted outward towards the far mountains, lighting up the landscape like daylight on Coruscant. It reached its goal. The sound of the explosion a second later seemed curiously muffled, as if the containing wall of Hajarna stone was as unaffected by the sound as it presumably had been by the explosion itself. A few seconds later, another even softer blast washed over them, echoed back from the mountains. The towers, almost reluctantly it seemed, ceased their firing, and once again the silence of the night settled in around them. They sat there in the quiet a long time, clinging to each other as they gazed out at the twisting yellow glow that was the fire's funeral pyre. Slowly, as the hangar bay fire burned itself out, Luke felt Mera's pain similarly fade away. But to his surprise, it was not a hopeless bitterness or even simple weariness that rose within her to fill the space left by the pain. She had mourned her loss and spent her grief, and now, as it would always be with her, it was time to put feelings and emotions aside and focus again on the task that needed to be done. And indeed, a minute later, she stirred in his arms. We better go, she said, her voice slightly ragged with the after-effects of her crying, but otherwise calm and clear. They're going to be fighting that fire for a while. This is probably our best chance to sneak back in. From the size of that blast, I figured we ought to have knocked out everything in the hangar, Mara commented as they made their way back down the cliff toward their ship. At least as far as flyability is concerned. There may be something way in the back that they'll be able to salvage, but it's going to be a job to even get it out. 
She was babbling, she knew, her words tumbling out every which way in the aftermath of the exhausting emotional hammering she'd just gone through. She'd never much liked babblers herself, and the thought that she'd become one, even on a temporary basis, rather annoyed her. But oddly enough, it didn't actually embarrass her. That part wasn't a mystery either. If dumping everything on Luke the way she had up there hadn't totally ruined his opinion of her, a little babbling wasn't likely to do it either. And it hadn't destroyed that opinion. That was probably the most surprising part of it all. It truly and genuinely hadn't. Picking her way down the cliff, she could still feel the same warmth and acceptance flowing from him that he'd wrapped so tightly around her up there. There was also, to be sure, a bit more concern and overprotectiveness in the mix than she was really comfortable with, but that was okay. That was just Luke, and it certainly wasn't anything she couldn't handle. I still don't know how we're going to do this, Luke said, stumbling briefly on a patch of loose rock behind her before he caught himself. It'll take way too long to go in through the cave again. I know, Mara agreed. Park mentioned there were gaps in the wall. I guess we'll have to go cross-country and then somehow climb up the side to one of them. That's going to be tricky, Luke warned. They're not going to be nearly as kindly disposed towards us as they were before. Mara snorted. That's okay, she said grimly. I'm not exactly all that kindly disposed towards them, either. Ahead and below now, barely visible in the faint starlight, she could see their borrowed ship, just beyond one last narrow fissure in the rock. Gathering herself, she leapt across the gap to a flat-topped boulder, and abruptly halted, flailing for balance on the rock as shock froze her muscles. Suddenly, unexpectedly, a strange thought or sound had flashed into her mind. Jedi Skywalker! Are you there? She lost the fight for balance and dropped rather awkwardly off onto the ground, barely able to keep her feet under her as she landed. But she hardly noticed. There at the ship, perched atop the TIE Fighter-style panels, were a dozen nervously fluttering shadows. Even as Luke landed on the ground beside her, one of the shadows detached itself from the ship and flew to, land to a landing on the rock they'd just vacated. It is you indeed, the thought echoed through her mind, the words framed by excitement and relief. I saw the great fire and feared you and Mara Jade had perished. It was Child of Winds. And she could hear him. She looked at Luke, saw her own surprise reflected in his face and mind. You do go in for dramatic changes, don't you, she managed, nodding towards the young Quam Quay. Nice touch, really. Luke lifted his hands, palm outward. Hey, don't look at me, he protested. I had nothing to do with this. Listen to me, please, Child of Winds cut in impatiently. You must go to the aid of the Quam Jaw. The Threateners have invaded their home. You mean the cave? Luke asked, frowning. All the way in, Mara added, or are they just at the front? There was a flurry of conversation back and forth between the alien and the others still hanging from the ship. We do not know, Child of Wind said. My friends from this nesting of the Quam Quay saw them enter the cave from large branches and machines. Mara looked at Luke. Large branches? Heavy weaponry, I'd guess, he said. How long were these branches? Some were twice as long as a Quam Quay, Child of Wind said, stretching out his wings for comparison. A little big for cleaning out a cave, Mara said. Sounds like they figured out that was how we got in. And are setting it up in case we come back, Luke said grimly. Well, we knew we couldn't get in that way anyway. I just hope the Qualm Jaw were able to clear out, the, uh, out of their way. Nothing we can do about it now, Mara said. And sitting here dithering would only give them more time to get ready for us. You're right, Luke said reluctantly. Let me go get R2 and we'll get moving. Do you not go to help the Quam Jaw? Child of Winds asked anxiously as Luke started past him. There's nothing we can do, Mara told him. We have to get back into the high tower right away. He stared up at her. But you promised. We promised only to do what we could, Mara reminded him. In this case, it turns out we weren't able to do all that much. She sighed. Look, for what it's worth, the Threateners don't consider either of you to be anything more than large, annoying vermin. 
If you stay away from their ships in the high tower from now on, they most likely won't bother you anymore. I understand, Child Wind said, his disappointment still heavy in his tone. I will pass along that message. I'm sorry we couldn't help you more, Amara said, but it's an imperfect universe, and no one ever gets everything he wants or thinks he wants. Part of growing up is to face that, accept it, and move on. The Quam Quay straightened up. And what is it that you want, Mara Jade? Mara looked over at the ship, at the open hatch into which Luke had vanished. It was, as it happened, a question she'd been turning over in her mind a lot lately. A question swirling with conflicting emotions and contradictory thoughts, with cautious hopes and wary fears. And a question she was definitely not interested in discussing with some strange junior alien. All I want right now is a way back into the high tower, she said, choosing a more immediate goal. Let's get through that one first, shall we? Child of Wind seemed to shiver. Back into the high tower? But why? Luke had reappeared in the hatchway now and was using the force to lower the droid to the ground. It'd take too long to explain, she said, but it's vitally important. Trust me. I do, he said with an unexpected fervor. I trust you and Jedi Skywalker both. He hesitated. And I can show you a way. Mara frowned. You can? Where? That direction, he said, jabbing his head towards a point just to the right of where the Hand of Thrawn would be. My friends say there is a hole in the rock beside the Lake of Small Fish that will lead to the cavern near where we first entered the High Fortress. Mara looked over at Luke, an odd thought beginning to whisper its way into her mind. Maybe tackling the High Tower itself wouldn't actually be necessary. Is it big enough for us to get through? I do not know. Child of Winds hesitated. But I am told it is the same passage the fire creepers use when they move under the ground. Mara felt her fingers twinge at the memory. The thought of sliding down a hole behind a horde of fire creepers frankly made her skin crawl. But if it was the only way, then it was the only way. Let me check with Luke. She crossed over to where he was standing beside the droid and ran him a quick summary. Sounds worth checking out, anyway, he agreed. How far away is this lake? It will not take long, Child of Winds assured him. By flight, it is very near. We can't take the ship, Luke told him. The threateners would spot us quickly. I do not refer to the flying machine. Abruptly, the Quam Quay seemed to straighten himself up. I and my friends will carry you there, and we will not be seen. Mara and Luke exchanged glances. Are you sure? Luke asked, glancing around the group. There aren't very many of, you, many of you, and we're not as light as we look. And we'll need to take our two, too. I and my friends will carry you there, Child of Winds repeated. Not for hope of gain, he added hastily, but because you have risked much already for the Quam Quay, and we have given nothing in return. It is only right for us to do this. Luke looked up at Mara. Going underground again will mean another long climb up the hidden stairway, you know, he warned. You sure you're up to that? Mara felt her lip twitch. Actually, I don't think we'll need to go into the high tower at all. Luke's forehead creased. Oh? I was just thinking a minute ago about that big power source R2 spotted when we first got into the underground room, she told him. The one off in the direction Keeper of Promises said was always fatal to Quam Jaw, who wandered off that way. She looked towards the high tower. And then, she added quietly, I started wondering about what Parkin th uh, said Thrawn had told them. That if he was ever reported dead, they should watch for his return ten years later. She felt Luke's moment of puzzlement, then the tightening of his commotions as he suddenly understood. You're right, he said, his voice low and dark. It would be just like him, wouldn't it? Just exactly like him. I think it's worth checking out anyway, Mara said. Definitely, Luke agreed, his voice and mind suddenly filled with new urgency. 
All right, child of winds, you're on. Get your friends organized and let's get moving. The major sitting glowering on the Camara's aft bridge comm display was middle-aged, overweight, and almost painfully uncultured. And if his answers were any indication, unimaginative and not particularly intelligent along with it. But he was also completely and unwaveringly loyal to his superior. The exact type of man, Pelion thought sourly, that Moff Disra would naturally choose to run interference for him. I'm sorry, Admiral Pelion, the major said again but His Excellency left no instructions on how he could be reached. If you care to talk with his chief of staff, I can see if he's available. My business is with Moff Disra personally, Pelion cut him off, already well tired of this game. And I strongly suggest you remember who it is you're speaking to. The Supreme Commander of Imperial Forces is by law to have reasonable access at all times to all high-ranking civilian leaders. The Major gathered himself into a sort of half-hearted attention. Yes, sir, I know that, he said, his tone on the edge of insubordination. It's my understanding, though, that His Excellency is in fact with the Supreme Commander. Pelion felt his face darken. What are you talking about, he demanded. I'm the Supreme Commander. Maybe you need to talk to Moff Disra about that, the Major said, clearly unfazed by the threat in Pelion's voice and face. Or Grant. He broke off, the stolid features twitching as if he'd belatedly realized he'd started to say something he shouldn't. But I personally have no official information on that, he finished a bit lamely. I expect His Excellency back within a few days. You can call back then. Of course, Pelion said softly. Thank you, Major, for your time. He keyed off the calm and straightened up, and only then did he allow the infinite tiredness within him to flow visibly out onto his face. To his left, standing in the archway leading to the Chimera's main bridge, Colonel Vermel stirred. It's bad, sir, isn't it? he asked. Bad enough, Pelion admitted, waving at the empty display. Blatant insubordination from Disra himself, I would have expected. But to get the same thing from a relatively minor lackey implies an exuberant confidence in Disra's place far beyond anything he should have. He stepped into the archway beside Vermal. And I can think of only one possible reason for that degree of confidence. Vermal made a sound in his throat. Grand Admiral Thrawn. Pelion nodded. The Major nearly said as much. I'm sure you caught that. And if Thrawn is back and is siding with Disra, he trailed off, the long years seeming to weigh even more heavily on his shoulders. After all this time, after all this tireless work and sacrifice for the Empire to be waved so casually aside, especially for someone like Disra. If he's siding with Disra, he continued quietly, then that is what is best for the Empire and we will accept it. For a minute they stood together in silence, the muted background of the Chimera's bridge activity the only sound. Pelion let his gaze sweep slowly across the bridge of his ship, wishing he knew what he should do next. If Thrawn was back, of course, he need do nothing. The Grand Admiral would make his wishes and orders known in his own good time. But if Thrawn wasn't back... He stepped forward and gestured to the intelligence duty officer at his portside crew pit station. We've intercepted several rumors of Grand Admiral Thrawn's return in the past two weeks, he said. Have any of the reports mentioned him being associated with any Star Destroyer other than the Relentless? Let me check, Admiral, the officer reported, keying his calm. No, sir, they haven't. All the rumors specify either the Relentless or Captain Dorja or both. Good, Pelion said. I want an immediate priority record search through Bastion Military Control. Find out where the Relentless is gone. Yes, sir. The officer busied himself at his board. You don't really think Dorja would file a destination plan against Thrawn's orders, do you? Vermo murmured. No, Pelion said. But I'm not convinced any of this heavy secrecy came from Thrawn in the first place. And if it was Disra's idea... He may not have thought to even mention to Dorja that he was hiding from me. Yes, but... 
Here it is, sir, the intelligence officer spoke up. The relentless Captain Dorja commanding left Bastion 20 hours ago en route for Yaga Minor. Transit time estimated at 12 hours. Passengers listed as Moff Dizra. He looked up and Pelion could see him swallow. And Grand Admiral Thrawn. Pelion nodded. Thank you, he said. Captain Ardiff? Sir? Ardiff said, looking up from his conversation with the systems monitor officer. Set course for Yaga Minor, Pelion ordered. We'll leave as soon as the ship is ready. Yes, sir, Ardiff said, turning around and lifting his hand towards the nav station. Navigator? I hope you know what you're doing, sir, Vermal said uneasily. If Thrawn and Disra are working together, forcing a confrontation with Disra in his presence may not exactly be a wise career move. Pelion smiled mirthlessly. Any considerations of career moves are far in my distant past, he said. More to the point, there's always the slim chance that Thrawn is somehow unaware of the worst of Dizra's offenses against the Empire. If so, it's my sworn duty as an Imperial officer to bring them to his attention. Admiral, a voice snapped from the sensor station. Ship and coming. Fifty-five degrees by forty. Unknown configuration, sir. Stand by defenses, Pelion replied calmly, eyes searching along the specified vector as he strode down the command walkway towards the viewport. Unknown ships, in his experience, were nearly always false alarms. An unfamiliar angle or modification, or else some obscure design that the particular sensor officer had never run into before. He caught a glimpse of the craft out the side viewport, and stopped in mid-stride, staring out of it in disbelief. What in the name of the Empire? Admiral, the comm officer called tentatively, his voice unnaturally high-pitched. Sir, they're hailing us. Rather, they're hailing you. Pelion frowned. Me personally? Yes, sir. He asked specifically for Admiral Pelion. Then you'd better put it on for the Admiral, hadn't you, Ardiff interrupted brusquely. Yes, sir, the boy gulped. Transmission on, sir. Hello, Admiral Pelion, a voice boomed from the bridge speakers. A male voice, speaking basic, with none of the more obvious accents or inflections usually associated with non-human vocal equipment. And a voice that seemed oddly familiar. Pelion realized with a sudden shiver. In fact, disturbingly familiar. Like an echo out of the distant past. You won't remember me, I'm sure, the voice continued but I believe we did meet once or twice. I'll take your word for it, Pelion replied, keeping his voice steady. To what do I owe the pleasure of your visit? I'm here to make you an offer, the voice said, to give you something you very much want. Really? Pelion looked at Ardiff, now standing in taut readiness beside the starboard turbolaser command station. I was unaware I was weighed down by any such unfulfilled desires. Oh, you don't know yet that you want this, the voice assured him. But you do. Trust me. I'll admit to being intrigued, Pelion said. How do you suggest we proceed? I'd like to come aboard and meet with you. Once you see what I have to offer, I think you'll understand the need for a certain degree of secrecy. I don't like it, Vermal murmured from beside him. It could be some kind of trick. Pelion shook his head. With an unknown alien ship as bait, he countered, gesturing at the vessel hanging motionlessly against the starry background off their starboard bow. If it's a trick, Colonel, it's an extremely good one. He cleared his throat. Captain Ardiff, he called. Make preparations to bring our guest aboard. And that's the end of the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.